Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're tuned in in the West. My name is Nick Khan, and I'm delighted to host today's Wine Communicators of Australia webinar on exporting wine. This is, in fact, the first of two successive webinars on the topic that WCA will be presenting in partnership with Wine Australia. In a month from today, on Friday the 4th of November, there will be a panel discussion with Wine Australia's four heads of market from the Americas, Europe, Asia and China, who by chance and good fortune will all be in Adelaide on the same day. In that session, we'll talk through the trends and events in each of these four key regions. Today is something of a primer and intended mainly for those who are new to export and looking to know what assistance and support is available to help them get things underway and moving in the right direction. We have six separate speakers who will each give a presentation and take any questions and then we'll open for further general questions and discussion if there is any. Wine Australia has run similar sessions at workshops around the country with great success, so WCA thought it would be useful to provide an online version for those of you who don't get to the workshops. Our speakers and the order of play for the day are as follows. The first four presentations will look at issues to consider when you are deciding how, where, when and maybe if to export. First, Wine Australia's senior analyst Mark Rowley will look at the information sources that are available to help you select export markets and the kind of specific questions he and his colleagues are available to answer. Next, we'll look at export finance support with Liam Carroll from EFIC, which exists to provide specialist support to Australian exporters. EFIC is not as widely known and understood as it should be in the wine industry, given what it has to offer. Then Nicola Kelly will provide an overview of what is available through TradeStart, a specialist arm of Austrade. And finally, Rebecca Fox, Wine Australia's Acting Manager for Export Assistance, will look at the important legal and compliance issues you need to be aware of before you start to export. Part two will then look at the kind of assistance that is available to you once you're in market. First, we'll hear from Ali Lockwood, Wine Australia's Manager for Stakeholder Engagement, and then hopefully from Linda Marcheson about Austrade's range of services and the financial assistance available via the Export Market Development Grants. I say hopefully because as I speak, Linda is just winding up a workshop and racing to join us. If the travel gods are against us, Nicola and Ali will be able to provide an Austrade overview and hopefully answer your questions. All of our speakers are Adelaide based and all bar Mark and Linda are with me in the offices of the AWRI but what they will be talking about is applicable to wineries anywhere in the country. Now if you would like to join in and ask a question, that's pretty simple. If you look at the small control panel on your screen, you'll see a question box. You just type the question, hit send, and we'll see it at this end, and I can feed it through to the presenters as appropriate. To any of you who have participated in WCA webinars before, yes, things do look a bit different on the screen, because WCA has moved to a different delivery platform, this time GoToWebinar with the support of Michael Downey here at the AWRI, so hopefully you can see us and hear us okay. And as with all WCA webinars, you will receive a copy of the slide deck and a link to view a session of the end at your leisure later this week. So let's get things underway, and I'll ask Mark Rowley from Wine Australia to talk about selecting export markets. Mark? Thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, basically I'll just give an overview over what we do first and we're here to support decision making. And I'm going to talk about some of the uh, resources that we invest in and any, everything I'll talk about today is uh, freely available to all of our stakeholders. So essentially we collect information from all across the supply chain from uh, grape production, what varieties are being produced in what regions, what prices are being paid for those and then this goes into inventory and we do this at both a uh, regional level and a global level. So some of the uh, sources available on a global level, uh, the IRV and on a more local level, the ABS and surveys we do as well and something that's on the horizon is Vinsights which I won't go into today. Uh, we also have a lot more, a lot of information on our sales and customers, and this is what I will really be focusing on today. So, what countries are shipping wine to where, and what is selling? So, by price point, varietal, and wine style, these are the key attributes of the wine that we can collect in the data. Uh, we also have a bit of information about who is buying the wine, so the importers, distributors, and also the consumer and we look at some of the perceptions of our wine and uh, the choice cues when they uh, select a bottle of wine off the shelf. 
So uh, more specifically, looking at how to export, the first step would be to uh, select a market. So this is the next slide now. Um, the first uh, thing to do is to actually pick a market. And this could be as easy as having a contact in India, for example. But if you want to use the data for a strategic approach, uh, we've got a lot of uh, information that you can uh, use. So what I would be going to first is looking at our export data. So everyone that gets exported from Australia needs to be approved from us. And we know exactly what variety it is, uh, what region it's coming from, and, and the prices that it's going out at. So if you were looking for a market, for instance, where uh, Shiraz Cabernet was growing at above $20 per bottle, you could quickly look through our data and uh, shortlist a few markets to look at. Um, you could also flip the strategy around and go, I've got a McLaren Vale wine and I'm looking for a market that's, that's growing but there's not much McLaren Vale wine in the market. So it's really about developing a strategy that you think will be a winner and then, and then looking at the data to find that ideal market. Uh, generally speaking though, um, growth is what uh, people are looking for throughout the world. Um, step two would be doing some planning into that market and uh, finding a buyer. A really good place to start is to go to our export market guides. Um, in these guides you get some really good high level information on uh, taxes, regulations, uh, cultural uh, impacts in the market and uh, yeah, really good start to, uh, to uh, look into a market. Uh, if you were looking at going to the market as well, a really good place to talk to first would be our in-market offices. Uh, we've got offices in Shanghai, San Francisco, London and also uh, Sydney. We look after Asia through uh, Heroes Jammer. So if you're going into market, they're really good to talk to and uh, just let you know you're going to be there. Um, we've also got some other sources of uh, who all the importers and distributors are in the uh, market. So if you're in looking into Asia, for instance, uh, Deborah Mayberg has got some really good Asian market guides who, uh, which uh, list all of the uh, key importers and uh, distributors within uh, some of those markets. Uh, just recently we've also found some other sources online which uh, we haven't purchased yet but for uh, 60 bucks uh, you can go to Best Wine Importers and find a whole list of retailers and importers in the market and it's a really good start just to start uh, looking at who the ideal people you might uh, want to talk to, uh, sending out some emails and, and phone calls as well. So the third step would be after finding a market and identifying a potential buyer to try and uh, seal the deal and here you can use uh, data as well to help you along. Um, so there, there's two main ways you can use data here and one's putting the business case forward. So people are, are self-interested and they want to know how much money they can make from you. Um, calculating this can be difficult though, but what we do have is uh, calculators on uh, on our website. Uh, the Deloitte's one actually went up today, and this can help you calculate where all the dollars are flowing. So what your FOB price needs to be to make an ideal gross margin, and then factoring in what the distributors, importers, retailers all need to uh, make along the way. Uh, so this would be letting the distributor know exactly how much wine you've got to sell and then they can work out how much uh, they'll be making out of the deal as well. Um, you can also use the data to help convince the uh, distributor that uh, they need your wine for example. Um, so here depending on the market where we have got sales data or if we don't using the export data you can show that uh, the category that you're selling the wine into is actually in gross. So if it's that Shiraz category above $20 and, and it's up by 20% but that distributor doesn't actually have any of that wine, uh, it could prove to them, them that uh, they're missing out on an opportunity there. 
Um, so yeah, that would be how I would be going about um, framing some of those uh, questions that this should be asking. Of course, it's just uh, a small piece of the puzzle, but important nevertheless. Um, so the next step of using data in exporting wine is once you've got the deal done and you've got your markets uh, monitoring what's going on with those exports. So uh, your buyer is going to be telling you what's happening in the market, so it's a good cross-reference to make sure what they're talking about is actually what's going on. Uh, people actually use the export data as well as an educational tool for sales reps uh, from the distributors, so just letting them know how important the Australian wine category is. Is it worth $10 million, $20 million into the market each year, and is it growing? Um, so a good good educational tool. Uh, you'll be talking about projections at this point, so it's useful to use as evidence to um, base the projections of something for next year's sales. And if the distributor is talking them down, it, it might be a good uh, place to come in and say, no, this is we actually need to uh, sell more wine next year. Um, it's also good for setting benchmarks and, and examining new potential products into the market. So if you're uh, shipping in the uh, Shiraz there, um, is there a place for a Riesling as well? So you can just benchmark against other players in the Australian market and see what's going on and uh, do some forecasting. So they're the uh, main ways I would be using the data into the market and, and I've got some final questions to finish on and these are real world questions that I get every day. So again we go back to that planning stage, uh, which markets are Chardonnay above $20 per bottle growing in? So I'd be looking at the export data and that could tell you and if it's the US and UK and some of our bigger markets we've, actually, we've got depletion started there to uh, look at that from a retail sense. Uh, which markets are demanding organic wine? So we've got uh, all of the exports are listed if they're organic or biodynamic. Um, in the case of the Swedes, they're, they're our biggest market for organic wine. So we've got that there. Um, I've got a new packaging concept. Which markets are, or consumers are going to be more open to trying these new products? So uh, some of the information we can't put on wine facts, but if you contact us, um, uh, purchased other data that looks at uh, different groups of consumers that are interested in some of those uh, trying new things. So millennials are going to be more open to alternative varietals and, and drinking wine in a can, for example. Um, so what price will my uh, wine be uh, in, in a particular market, Poland for instance, and uh, what are my marginal requirements? So this is where we go back to the ready reckoners and pricing calculators that are, that are available from us. And it's important to know um, what prices those wines will land in market at. Um, I'm going to type A, who can I meet to showcase my wines? So we come back to the Deborah Mayberg wine list. And um, in the case where you're selling a lot more wine, maybe you don't have the fruit anymore and you need to work out how much uh, you would be expecting to pay for a McLaren Vale Grenache, for instance. So here you would be using uh, a vineyard survey to look at what the market rates are for those uh, grapes. Um, if you need to look at the numbers in a bit more deeper perspective, uh, I get a question quite often that uh, they're exporting to China, but the uh, businesses exports are only up by 10-15% but the market rate is 50%. Why is that? Um, so we can actually help out and dig behind the numbers and, and look at different categories of exporters. Um, so in the case of China, the uh, big companies are leading the way and businesses with Chinese equity as well are really driving the growth there. Um, but in saying that, there's, there's still strong growth for everyone else. Um, how much will my wine be priced in New York? So um, you can look at um, what that uh, 
ten dollar FOB wine will end up in in New York, for instance, um, after you include all the taxes and uh, imported margins, retailer margins, etc. And then you can look at uh, how that that uh, segment is going for those wines uh, by price point and varietal. Um, we've also got some of that softer information, so are there cultural sensitivities in marketing by wine in India, for example? Um, so we've got a lot of research behind just the numbers um, on issues that uh, are less numbers related. Um, and then there's a few other questions. My distributor is forecasting lower sales. How can I convince them otherwise? So I've been through that earlier with uh, some of the data that can help out there. Um, and then what regions have been successfully exporting wine throughout the world and can I learn something from them? So all of our export data is um, labelled by region. So um, if you can see someone's doing something well, um, there's uh, ways to learn off of them. So that's just uh, a bit of a recap on the type of questions I get every day. And we do run a support line and we're more than happy to help out. So there's three of us in the team. So uh, yeah, if you can't find what you're looking for on the website, feel free to drop us a line or email us. Thank you, Mark. Um, a good overview. I hope that'll get you a lot more work in the coming weeks and months. And of course, this slide will be in the pack we'll send out to everybody so you'll have the direct contact details for Mark, Peter and Angelica to get in touch with them and, and ask some of those kind of questions that Mark just foreshadowed. I'm now going to talk, uh, we're now going to talk export finance and I'll throw over to Liam Carroll. As you can see, he's the account manager for SMEs in South Australia for EFIC, uh, but he's going to give an overview of what EFIC can offer uh, in terms of providing finance to uh, Australian wineries. Liam. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Um, as said there, I'm the um, account manager for SME for EFIC in South Australia. So who is EFIC? Um, the e easiest way I can um, explain who we are is to say we're essentially a bank. Um, the only difference being is we're owned by the federal government. Um, we operate completely on commercial principles. Um, their purpose is to uh, fill what we call the market gap. So that's for exporters that um, can't get finance through the domestic banks for whatever reason. Um, generally that is um, the lack of uh, real estate security. So in 2015, um, there was the Australian International Business Survey. They surveyed uh, 1,200 Australian businesses and of that group, 34% came back with a response that they were unable to secure funding um, for specifically for their export, uh, for their export contracts. Um, and of that group, 45%, so almost half of that group, the primary reason for them not being able to secure finance um, was due to a lack of um, security. So that is basically EFIC's purpose. Because um, I don't have a lot of time, I will just concentrate on traditional exporters. So um, we can help traditional exporters, also customers in a export supply chain, and also customers looking to um, expand offshore. Um, we do that two ways. We have direct funding, so you're an exporter, in this case a winery, you get a $100,000 contract, you need working capital to go purchase grapes, um, you know, employ your contract winemaker or pay suppliers, whatever, pay wages. Um, we can, you go to your bank, the bank says, sorry, love your wine, but um, we can't we can't finance for whatever reason, that's where EFIC can step in and provide a direct loan. On the other hand, we can also go to your bank and be your security instrument. So we can go to your bank, provide our guarantee, which is AAA rated, and the bank then can do the funding and essentially the bank takes on Australian government risk and we take on the risk of the uh, SME exporter. Um, what does a, uh, a typical EFIC client look like? Um, as opposed to, I think there's probably a thousand different definitions of an SME out there. Um, 
EFIC definition is any business turning over less than $150 million. So uh, here in South Australia, that's almost everyone. Um, I think if you probably go to most states, most companies fall into a, uh, a business turning over less than $150 million. Uh, there is no minimum turnover in terms of um, what type of customer we can deal with, but um, obviously you need a sufficient turnover to be able to repay whatever debt you're looking to take out. Um, we typically work with growing businesses in that there has to be a financing requirement. Um, EFIC doesn't provide core debt or balance sheet debt, anything like that. We really are short-term working capital financiers. Um, so as you grow, as businesses grow, as you guys would know, um, you then tend to use up all your available security, um, especially if you hit a, a certain point. So uh, that's where we can step in. Um, track record of delivery, basically that means that uh, we don't typically work with startups. Um, as I said, I think a few slides earlier, um, we operate on commercial principles. So. Um, we like to see a customer that has a long track record in an industry. Um, we don't typically also look at first time exporters, so a lot of the time we will not finance your first export, um, but um, if we were to do so, we would need to see a strong um, domestic business underpinning that. Um, but from export two, three, four, five onwards, um, we can certainly support. Australian content, we're Australia's export credit agency, so um, there has to be some benefit um, coming back to Australia, so um, I think most of the wineries we're dealing with today would be based in Australia though, so it's not really an issue. We have a um, minimum financing requirement of 50,000. There is no maximum, um, so the sky's the limit there, I suppose. Um, lack of tangible security, um, it's, it's certainly not a, a deal breaker, but that tends to be the a typical attribute of an EFIC client. So, um, yeah, that really that, that inability to have a property on the line or all that property has all been used up and unable to gain finance through the domestic banks. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to go to 50 different banks and get, you know, hard declines or anything like that. Um, I've got 10 years banking experience, almost all the people that work for EFIC are from the banking sector, so we've got a pretty rough, uh, pretty good idea um, who get finance and who's going to struggle to get finance. So, um, yeah, but before we would uh, do any particular transaction, we do always speak to the bank, um, your particular bank, and make sure that um, they don't want to do the finance for whatever reason. Um, we support all industries. Um, but most importantly, we support all geographies. I should say most geographies are there. So um, again, in the domestic banks, there'll be a list of uh, countries that they don't support for whatever reason. Um, our, our list is much smaller. Um, it basically boils down to countries that have uh, UN sanctions against them or something like that. And Liam, I know you've got a couple of wine case studies coming, but what's been the pickup from the wine industry in general? Have they been keen users of EFIC finance? Um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, especially in South Australia. Uh, if I had to uh, guess, I'd say in South Australia, which is obviously where I work, um, probably 60 to 70 percent of our inquiry rate is through the wine industry. Um, I don't know what that number is nationally, but um, I think if you went through the case studies, I've used today all South Australian case studies because mm -hmm. I'm a bit patriotic, but there'd be a case study for a winery, I think, in just about every state. Okay. <laughs> Um, Gem Tree Wines based in McLaren Vale, so as we spoke about earlier, um, I had a, um, an export contract in the United States, um, went to their bank, the bank said yeah it's a great great transaction, however it was that lack of security again that, that played a part, so um, we provide an export, export working capital guarantee to the bank, the bank did the funding and we, uh, EFIC essentially becomes the security instrument. Um, that was replicated again with the Limestone Coast wine, so different region but same result. Um, different countries again, they had contracts in UK and Indonesia. Um, again, we provide 
um, working capital guarantee to their bank, and um, and that was uh, repaid. This one here is a little bit different. Zonte's footstep, um, also based in McLaren Vale. Um, they use small business export loans. So that's our newest product that was launched in April of 2016. That is a completely online product whereby um, I don't know if anyone's ever applied for a credit card or something like that online. It's about as difficult as that. So you log on, put your details in, you upload some information, um, you get a finance approval from once you've hit the submit button, you get a finance decision in two working days and then you get finance in seven working days. So all up, it's a nine day turnaround. So I don't know if anyone's got finance through the banks before, but generally speaking, nine days would be um, pretty unusual. So um, yeah, it's it, it's very much a very standardised product whereby you either fit it or you don't. It's got a set of criteria, so that's on the first page. Um, if you don't fit that criteria for whatever reason, then you can go down our traditional process whereby you call, um, you know, Andrew Perkins or myself in South Australia and um, we tailor a, a, a loan to your needs. Um, so to, to summarise, um, EFIC is, is Australia's export credit agency. We're here to help exporters. Um, we can also help customers that are involved in the export supply chain. So uh, one step removed from an export. So for to use wine as an example, we can help a winery, but we can also help a company that produces wine bottles, for instance. For instance, um, we're specifically uh, set up to look at international transactions. Um, so we're not a, a domestic bank by any stretch of the ma imagination. It's um, purely um, set up around exporting. Uh, market gap, as I said earlier, so it's it's when a commercial bank. Um, uh, won't fund a transaction for whatever reason. Um, um, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't want, want to make it very clear. You don't have to go out and get ten different declines or speak to ten different banks. Um, if your existing bank, even if you've only got a transaction or banking relation with, banking relationship with them, if you speak to them and they're they're not interested for whatever reason, that for us classifies as market gap. Um, and our role is is not only just to. Um, to lend out money, it's also to support those financiers as well. We've got an office in every state except for Tasmania. Tasmania is run out of Victoria, um, and the ACT is obviously also run out of New South Wales. Um, so obviously, this presentation I think will be sent around. So there'll be a list of contact details. Um, but if you have any questions, you can also contact me anytime as well. That's great. Thank you, Liam. Um, we'll move now from the finance side of things to the broader support that's available through Tradestart. As I said, Tradestart is a, is a specialist arm of um, Austrade, <clears throat> and here in South Australia, Nicola Kelly is one of the export advisors. So she's now going to give us a, a quick summary of what Tradestart can offer you. Great. Thanks, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Nick mentioned, today I'm going to talk about Tradestart and how it can assist your business with exporting. So the primary aim of Tradestart Network is to help small and medium-sized businesses in their export en endeavours. It is an international business initiative of the Australian Government, Austrade, and is delivered around Australia in partnership with state, territory and local governments, industry associations and chambers of commerce. Tradestart is kind of the face of Austrade on the ground in the regions, and we do work on a regional basis. Within the wine sector, I look after Adelaide South, which incorporates Adelaide Hills, McLaren Vale and Langhorn Creek. So there are 27 different Trade Start advisors around Australia. Um, so I don't have everybody's contact details available today, but they're on the Austrade website and I'm more than happy to send anybody the link to that. So, so this map represents the different um, Austrade locations in the little red dots and also the blue dots show the different trade start advisors. Um, so as you can see, um, it's quite well represented all around Australia. So what do the trade start advisors do? While our mandate is to work with companies that are already export ready, we are also able to provide basic information through the Austrade website that can assist you to become export ready. We are hands on in that we sit down with our clients and work out where the gaps in their export knowledge are, what information they need and who else we can link them to for the required information. 
We work with a diverse range of companies, ranging from small one-person businesses with suitable products or services to export, to much larger businesses that have been exporting for many years. We assist companies in developing an export strategy so that you can have a plan and to focus on and can also guide you through the steps of exporting. We can also assist you with your market selection to determine whether your product is suitable for a particular market and the steps you need to undertake to maximise your opportunities in that particular market. So following on from Mark's comments earlier on undertaking researching and planning, that is one of the major areas that we can assist with. Through Wine Australia and Austrade, we can assist you to find information relevant to particular markets, including tariff and tax information, import regulations, labelling regulations, and provide information on the types of marketing materials that may work best in particular markets. We also provide tips on doing business overseas and how markets differ from each other in the way that they work, including import requirements, sales tiers, and market regulations. We can also provide advice on market entry requirements, for example, what certification, labelling and requirements your wine will need to fulfil to enter a market. We also provide referrals to companies that specialise in areas that Austrade and Tradestart do not generally assist with. So for example, Austrade has a large database of specialist service providers that provide services in areas such as strategy planning, marketing, tax, intellectual property and more. So we can provide contact details for relevant companies as required. Tradestart also provides information on, information on wine for overseas trade shows, trade missions and government-led overseas promotions, both from the state and national perspective, through Wine Australia, Austrade and state governments. For example, the South Australian government has an ongoing calendar of overseas missions to targeted countries. Within these missions, we have a targeted wine focus program, which is suitable for companies already exporting to these markets, as well as those that are new to market. So other states have similar programs, which your local Tradestart advisor will be able to talk to you about. There are grants that are available to assist you with your export related expenses. So information on the Export Market Development Grant is available through the Austrade website. And there will be some further information in Linda's um, presentation about this grant later today. There are also various grants relating to export from various state governments. For example, the Export Partnership Program is administered by the South Australian Government and can provide up to $50,000 for eligible export-related expenditure for South Australian companies. That's great. Thank you, Nicola. Um, again, there's uh, lots of information on the website and it's well worth getting in touch with the, uh, the, the relevant person in your region. There's 27 different offices, but um, I know from talking to Ali that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of Australian wineries who have made good use of the Trade Start Program uh, and it's well worth looking into. Let's move now into a little bit of more nitty gritty of, uh, of exporting, the uh, how to export the, the approval processes and, and the compliance side of things. So I'll um, call on Rebecca Fox. Rebecca is the label a, a label integrity auditor with Wine Australia, but currently also the export manager for export assistance. And she'll talk to us a little bit about what's involved on the, the legal side of things. Thanks, Nick. Welcome everyone. So as Nick introduced me, my name is Rebecca Fox. At the moment I'm the Acting Manager of Export Assistance for Wine Australia, but I, my other hat is a, a Label Integrity Auditor. So I'm providing information from both of of regulatory services today. My other job today is to share with you some information on how to go about exporting wine through the regulatory process. Essentially there's four main steps in the export approval process through Wine Australia licensing, product registration, shipping approval and import certificates where required. We're here to help you throughout the process. All consignments greater than 100 litres require the exporter to hold a wine export licence. You can apply for this online on our website and the process usually takes between three and five business days. It's fairly straightforward. Once you've received your licence, you can apply for continuing approval for the products you wish to export. This can also be done online on our export approval system or via a form on our website. Registration of products requires details to be provided on the label integrity composition of the wine as well as the labelling along with a certificate of analysis. 
This is so we can check the compliance with the Food Standards Code and also the Label Integrity Program. Once the continuing approval numbers have been issued, a shipping permit can be applied. Once you know the details of the shipment, you can go about applying for your shipping approval. Again, this can be completed online on our export approval system or via a form on our website. And the information such as the vessel name, the department to date can always be updated later if things change. So we really recommend applying for approval as early as possible. Once you've received your WBC number for the shipment, this is what you use to provide to customs to get your shipment out of Australia. Certain markets also require import certificates for the shipment to clear customs. VI1 certificates are required for all EU markets and these can only be obtained from Wine Australia. The VI1 analysis, which needs to be supplied in order to obtain these certificates, must be requested by a NATA accredited laboratory and then supplied to Wine Australia. Other markets such as China require certificates of origin and free sale in order to gain preferential tariffs on entry. Wine Australia is able to supply most of these certificates and due to an increased demand for certificates for China in particular, we've recently implemented an automated certificate system to allow for faster processing for our exporters. As mentioned earlier by Mark, we have export market guides and these cover 33 of the main export markets and are a really great source of information for exporters who are new to or considering entering these markets. The regulatory information included in these guides, things like wine standards, labelling requirements, importing procedures and tariffs and taxes are all things that need to be taken into account when deciding on which market to send your wine to. The guides are free for all exporters and great levy payers via our website. So if I had to provide my top tips for exporting, there would be three main things I would say. Firstly, ensure you've applied for your licence and have product approval for the wines you're wishing to export. Secondly, apply for shipping approval as early as possible, remembering that changes can be made to the permit closer to the departure date if needed. And thirdly, as mentioned by most speakers today, research the market well, and I'm talking from a regulatory point of view. Is your wine legally able to be sold there? And by that I mean, are the additives you've used legal in that market? And are your maximum residue limits in your wine permitted in those markets? What are the labelling requirements? If free labelling is required, these costs and the additional time needs to be factored in. And know what additional documentation is required to get your shipment through customs and organise this as early as possible. And if you've ever got any questions about exporting to a new market or the export process, please don't hesitate to contact us. The export assistance team and the label integrity auditors are always available to help you out. Thanks for having me. That's great. Thank you, Rebecca. We're now going to move from the, uh, the technical side of things to the bit more colour and movement with the marketing activities. And I'll ask Ali Lockwood, uh, the manager for stakeholder engagement for Wine Australia, to come and just talk a little bit briefly about what's available to help you out in the market. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Nick. Um, as Nick said, I'm here to talk about what to do once you're in the market. So a lot of the conversation has been about how to get in and how to enter the market and I'm going to talk about what to do once you're in the market to give your wine and your brand the biggest focus and biggest chance possible to succeed. Um, wine Australia's goal is to have a prosperous Australian grape and wine community um, by two means. Our first priority is increasing demand and the premium paid for all Australian wines and we really do that through a lot of our marketing activity and having a very specific focus upon regional and fine wine to improve the um, value paid for wine um, and our second priority is to increase competitiveness and we achieve that through a lot of our research and 
development um, that we fund and to help improve our viticultural and winemaking expertise and practices. So what does Wine Australia do? Well, you've heard from Mark and you've also heard from Rebecca Fox as well too. Um, our export compliance, we, provide, um, we regulate the Australian wine exports through, through issuing export licences, providing documentation and having a label integrity program. Um, Mark touched on some of the data that is available. We also have an international neck of offices, which I'll touch on in a minute, and our export market guides, and a plethora of information through our research and development um, area of our organisation. Um, the area that I'm specifically focusing upon today is our marketing activity. We also assist with trade barriers and assist in reducing or removing um, barriers to trade in international markets through government to government negotiations. But the marketing activity is where I'll focus um, the rest of this conversation upon. And the reason why we have these, uh, these programs in place is to facilitate wineries and brands to export and to improve winemaking and viticultural practices. So what type of marketing activities does Wine Australia do? Well, we run about 120 different events each year across 20 markets. 50 of those are user pay um, initiatives that wineries can pay to play in. And then around about 70 are directly funded by Wine Australia. So some examples of some things that we do do are starting from the top trade events. So we participate in a number of trade events globally. Events like Provine, which is held in Germany, it's the largest trade show in the world with 50,000 trade attending each year. Vin Expo in Hong Kong, which is a critically important event for us. Um, we have started to participate again at events like London Wine Trade Fair. Um, so we assess all trade events that are available to us across the globe and we pick the highest priority events to participate in. And we usually have a Wine Australia stand that brands and regions and states can directly participate in. We run retail promotions, whether that's in a physical retail outlet or chain or whether that's online. At the moment we're running a retail promotion with Alibaba in China. Um, we do a lot of masterclasses. I um, would argue that we or guess that we probably run one a week at least within our organisation somewhere in the world. It is a really important element of what we do to help promote our fine wine and regional messaging. We have educational initiatives. We have a network of educators all across Asia who deliver Australian wine content on our behalf. Um, to more than 5,000 uh, wine lovers and uh, wine trade each year. Um, we run our own tastings, so trade events can be, we, we are very aware trade events, um, third party trade events are very expensive to participate in. They can be $5,000 or more just to purchase a stand space. So often we run our own dedicated Wine Australia trade events. Um, and we've recently held some in Seoul and in Tokyo in conjunction with Austrade in both of those markets. Some of you might have read the media about them. So they're smaller events but much more targeted and much more accessible for companies to tap into. We also do advertorials with major publications globally and we have around about a hundred different um, media and educators who come and visit Australia as a guest of Wine Australia each year. So who participates in our activities? Well, most of our participants for the use of pay activities are small and medium sized companies. You can see 47% are small, 24% uh, are um, agents or importers that sign up to our events and a lot of those agents and importers represent small and medium sized companies. Um, so really that the small and medium sized companies are the great beneficiaries of the market programs because we represent you in the market and we make sure that your wine is in the right hands and being shown to the right people. And it saves you from either participating directly or setting up office internationally. We have an international network. Um, we've just recently established an office in San Francisco with Aaron Ridgway, who is our new head of market in the US. He covers all of North America. We have Shelley Hammer-Jackson, who's based in Vancouver. 
Um, we have Ben Von Dusa who looks after our market entry program for new to market brands in New Jersey. We're co-located with Tourism Australia in London, Shanghai and Sydney and our head office is in Adelaide. I guess the key point to note is that our um, offices are paid for by grape grower and exporter levies, so they're an investment that is made directly by industry to support Australian wine exports. So they are there for you to tap into when you are next visiting an international market or seeking to export to any of the regions where we have an office. And I can hear what you're all thinking. How much is that going to cost? Well, I'm very pleased to say nothing. Um, nothing for Wine Australia's time, resourcing, intelligence, relationships, PR, etc. We do not charge for our time and our support. What we do charge for is the direct costs, such as charging um, for room hire, catering, etc. So we're not a commercial entity. We, we do not make a profit from any of our events and our time is not charged at all because we are there to support the Australian wine sector. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to quickly whiz through this, but um, some of the events we participate in are Fin Expo in Hong Kong, where Barossa had a strong representation. Um, the Australia Day Tastings in London is the biggest country tasting that is held in the UK. We had 1,200 people attend last year and it's getting larger every year. We've just changed venues to accommodate. Um, there was a queue out the door. Someone saw Jance Robinson in the queue too, which was a bit unfortunate. Uh, Provine in uh, Germany, which I touched on before, it is the largest trade show for wine globally, a very important show for Australia. And we've increased our stand space 30%. It is booked out for next year. Um, it almost becomes booked out as soon as the stand space is released. It's a very popular event. We do do a lot of um, bespoke activities with states and regions as well. So we work with state governments, um, also with regional associations. I won't run through each of those because um, there's quite a lot of detail in this slide, but I'd be happy to take phone calls um, after this session if anyone wants to know anything more about these individual initiatives. Um, I thought I'd mention the Australian Wine Flavours card, <clears throat> which was developed off the back of um, some research that was done with the University of South Australia and funded by Wine Australia. The card links Australian wine descriptors with an equivalent taste identified by Chinese customers. So an example is blackberries. They don't exist in China, so Chinese consumers and trade have no knowledge and understanding of what smell to smell when they're smelling blackberries. So instead um, a, an equivalent um, fruit flavour has been selected and that's been included in the Australian Wine Flavours card. So this is a really fantastic tool to use in your cellar doors or if you're travelling internationally to China. Um, our visits program, I mentioned we bring around 100 visitors out each year. The great Great news is in this financial year Wine Australia will be funding all visits. In the past we have asked states and regions to fund our visit program but instead we will be funding this directly. Um, so to, get a, 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 to become a part of this and make sure you have the best opportunity to include your wines, please make sure you are directly connected with your regional association because they will be our main point of contact to organise visits in the region. Just very quickly, um, we also are working with the world's best 50 best restaurants who are um, coming to Melbourne next year and we are considering bringing out their sommeliers as well too and sending them around Australia so that there should be some exciting opportunities there as well as some tastings to be held in Melbourne around the time of the world's 50 best restaurants. So for any more information that you need, our, um, we have all of our market program um, initiatives on Wine Australia. .com. There's many, many different initiatives listed on there. Alternatively, you can contact market.programs at wineaustralia.com for further information. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Now we've, we've got about 10 minutes to go. I'm just going to yell out into cyberspace and see if Linda is in fact there. Are you there, Linda? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? No. Hello. Oh, great. Yes, hello. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Linda. <laughs> 
Great. Thanks very much. And I, I do realise it's a, I'm at the tail end. Can you hear us okay? I can. I can. Thank you so much. So I'll kick off. Yes. Quick run through of how Austrade fits into the picture, please. Absolutely. Okay. I'm at, I realise I'm at the tail end of a long list of presentations. So I'll be super, super quick with this quick, um, general information, but of course happy to answer any questions. Uh, so next slide. Our role, Austrade, uh, essentially exists to help Australian companies do business overseas. So we are there to develop international markets, win productive foreign direct investment. We work with both the education and tourism sectors and we support DFAT in supplying um, consular and passport services in many overseas locations. Uh, slide number four, please. Skip over the next one. Our network is large, so if you head to the international map, fantastic. Uh, we have over 80 offices in nearly 60 countries. So I like to think that in most um, overseas destinations where an Australian wants to do business, there is some form of local Australian support. Uh, next slide, we've got the domestic map, as Nicola mentioned, we've got the Austrade offices in both um, the state capitals and, and territory capitals, as well as um, the Trade Start Network, so our, our partner and allies in uh, regionally, with an extension of Trade Start Export Advisors who are based and work in regions. Uh, next slide. So uh, Austrade is, uh, we'll do a number of things, but first and foremost, do offer the advice. We're very lucky to have locally um, based um, colleagues in our markets overseas, uh, coupled with the sector lead specialists um, here in Australia to help with the very basics of international market selection, particularly if you're getting approached from, from different potential partners. You might not know who's who in the zoo. We can help steer you through that. Uh, again, with our locally engaged colleagues, they're the ones who we go to for um, international business um, culture and etiquette. Uh, we work, um, we run um, some international promotions um, on our own, and many, uh, most are with um, international partners. So we um, have a number of small, um, right through to large. Um, thousand person missions that we that we uh, organize we also offer a grant scheme which I'll touch on just shortly next slide uh, international networks this is a, a key uh, service that we deliver through our offshore network it's one of the most commonly asked questions is about you know finding the right importer and finding the right partner we work together with you in get developing a bit of a you know, an ideal profile of who your partner is offshore and we work with our colleagues uh, to, you know, to help you navigate through the market. Uh, they're the ones that build the networks and contacts with the, the key decision makers and, and buyers um, locally, both in food service, uh, food retail and online. Uh, and where we don't know, uh, we refer to specialist providers, um, again, as Nicola mentioned. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have a whole bunch of information um, and insights as well. This is where our colleagues drill down uh, and look at the um, next slide there, thank you, uh, what's happening in market and feed that back um, through to us. We have, as, as you would have seen, an extensive network um, and particularly some of those growing markets um, throughout Asia, Middle East, um, Latin and Central um, Europe. So we have a whole bunch of services um, and support that is delivered free of charge, um, no, no issues, uh, and then we can go into tailored bespoke uh, work specifically just for you, and that is on a fee-for-service arrangement. So we have, uh, I guess, a bit of a user-pay system depending on what, what you're after. Next slide. So here's a sample of um, some of the tailored services that we do, some, some more detailed market research um, specifically, again, on your behalf. Uh, again, um, you know, working with our counterparts there, our business development managers, our trade commissioners and senior trade commissioners in identifying the right people for you. We get to know who you're um, looking for, right through to accompanying you to um, uh, in important meetings. So particularly if there's a, a language um, issue and then the all important follow up after uh, a visit. Uh, next slide, uh, we have, we administer the Export Market Development Grant Scheme, which many, many people in the wine sector are aware of. Um, it's the only grant scheme that we deliver, uh, but it's essentially a reimbursement scheme to help offset the cost of promoting yourself overseas. So all those flights that you take to travel to a trade show, the trade show expenses, 
getting material interpreted um, and translated rather. Um, there's about eight different categories of eligible expenditure and we have a whole team that looks after um, all the applications for the annual submission of, uh, of the Export uh, Market Development Grant Scheme. Uh, there is a minimum threshold spend of $15,000 first and then anything over and above that um, uh, of eligible expenditure is reimbursed 50%. As you can see, it's, um, it's a reasonably well-funded scheme and it does uh, it is accessed by um, quite a, a number of Australian exporters. We have a whole bunch of free material on, online, um, so if, you, if you're still a bit new to this, we've got a, an export um, readiness indicator which acts as a bit of a prompter. We've got a bunch of market profiles as well, and some do uh, drill down into industry sectors. Um, but I, I thoroughly recommend the export guides from Wine Australia that go into um, extensive detail for, for a number of markets. Subscribe to our export update, you won't miss out on any event, small or large, taking place here in Australia or overseas. Um, next slide, committed to customer service and also committed to um, ensuring that uh, you know companies don't fall into um, any bribery um, issues. So we only work with uh, Australian companies who adhere to uh, international uh, anti-bribery laws. Next slide, that's it from me, some basic contact information. Um, I'm sorry to whiz through that, but um, I'm certainly um, pleased I was able to join remotely. Over to you. Thank you. Linda for providing that. Um, we're nearly out of time, so if you have questions for any of our presenters or their colleagues in other states, you'll see the contact details on the slides. Uh, please get in touch with them. Um, we hope you found today useful. The idea, as I said, was to be something of a primer to introduce you to the various uh, services and schemes that are out there to support you. I think in particular, EFIC is one that if you don't know about it to look into. Uh, Tracestud has an awful lot to offer. Austrade as well, and of course, Wine Australia. So please, um, they're there to help, so ask the questions. And a reminder that uh, on a Friday, strange for wine communicators of Australia, but one month from today we'll have the second part of our export series, which is looking very specifically at what's happening in market. So the four heads of market for wine Australia, Laura from Europe, Middle East and Africa, Aaron from North America, Hero of Asia and Willa from China, we'll all be in Adelaide together and we'll get them online for a one hour panel session um, to take as many questions as you want to put through on what they're seeing, what the trends are and what's happening. So. Um, for now, on behalf of Wine Communicators Australia, thank you to all of the panellists who joined me today. Thank you for Michael Downey for getting us through our, our first webinar using GoToWebinar with a minimum of fuss. Um, and we hope to talk to you uh, one month from today. Thank you.